Hello and welcome back to a meta guide to bulls. We're on episode seven now, which is Bullet Train. And before I get started, I'd like to thank everybody who's watched so far and is following all of this and everyone who's liked and subscribed and commented. Really appreciate it. And if you haven't already, please like and subscribe because it's really helpful to the channel. And I want to keep going with this for as long as it takes. And if you haven't seen this channel before or this series, what I'm doing is I'm looking at every song from the album balls and I'm putting it into a very particular context and that is of a band who are looking to break their record deal in order to win creative freedom for themselves and they're doing that by kind of sabotaging their own album by making this pop album that sounds like it's bound for the charts but is designed not to be appealing to the general public by having songs about things like public transport so speaking of which let's get going with bullet train it's the bullet train, bullet train, bullet train, yeah. It's a miracle, a miracle, a miracle, yeah. It's the bullet train, bullet train, bullet train, yeah. It's immaculate, 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 yeah. So it's song number two about public transport, but this is very different to Aeroflot. The Russian Airlines got a bad reputation and it's prone to crashing, whereas the bullet train is something to be admired. It's a feat of engineering and offers comfort and efficiency, and it's a real icon of Japan. And that's a, a country the, the male brothers have a close affinity to. But if every song tells us something about sparks, then what is it here? Well, assuming they're not talking about a train, then the thing they're talking about is a miracle and it's impeccable. And I think this is how sparks see their own work. So let's take a look at another example of that. That's the song Academy Award Performance, which is the second song they did as a disco band for Number One in Heaven. It's about acting, but that doesn't have to be in the sense of the movie industry, because they just reinvented themselves. They were a rock band entering this new world, so there's an element of acting to that, and they're really proud of the work they've done. They've made something that's well produced, with clever lines, that's well rehearsed and well defined. And then they acknowledge that there's money to be made in the biggest genre in the world. So there's one example of Sparks commenting on how great their own art is. So let's take a look at another one. That song is called How Do I Get to Carnegie Hall? And I've got a lot more to say about that in a future episode. But now let's just focus on the idea that Sparks have got technical facility and old world sensibilities and they're applying that in its full force on the album Little Beethoven. And now let's look at one final example. And this one's my favorite. This is from When I Kiss You, I Hear Charlie Parker Playing. She's a freak on great design, the finest of material, a little asymmetric pal, but that's the way it goes. My love for her just grows and grows. Anytime Sparks sing about a love interest, then if you shift your thinking and consider that they're talking about their own creative muse, then it almost always has really interesting ramifications for what the song is about. And here they compare her to a design by Frank Lloyd Wright, the great architect. So much like one of his houses, Sparks have got the finest of material, which is a little asymmetrical. So all of this is a great comic vanity that's hidden in plain sight. So if we go back to Bullet Train, so far we know that whatever they're talking about is a miracle and is impeccable. So let's listen to see what else it is. It's impossible, 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 yeah. It's the bullet train, bullet train, bullet train, yeah. It's impeccable, 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 yeah. It's the bullet train, bullet train, bullet train, yeah. So whatever the bullet train symbolizes, it's a miracle, it's immaculate, it's improbable, and it's impeccable. And all of this could apply to Sparks themselves, 
but I think it's far more specific than that. It's about what they're working on right now, and by that I don't mean Bulls. What I mean is if the purpose of Bulls is to win their creative freedom, then they're already looking forward to Little Beethoven, despite their claims that they only had the idea for it after recording the album Bulls. And there are many clues to this, because Bulls and Little Beethoven have very little in common, but there's something on this song which is found all over Little Beethoven and the albums that followed, and that is repetition. It's the bullet train faster and faster, oh yeah. It's the bullet train faster and faster, oh yeah. It's the bullet train faster and faster, oh yeah. It's the bullet train faster and faster, oh yeah. So the bullet train is heading full speed towards Little Beethoven, a practice run for the repetition that would characterise the upcoming era for Sparks. And Little Beethoven is an idea that they had even before balls. After all, gratuitous sax and senseless violins ended with this. He came home, and instead of hearing the usual drums and bass, he heard... For more on that, it's worth watching a meta guide to gratuitous sax and senseless violins. But it's fair to say that by losing the drums and the bass with Little Beethoven, this song is calling forward. So this foreshadows the orchestration, and then on the calm before the storm, they foreshadow the layering of the vocals. Something's up and down and up and down and up and and now they foreshadowed the repetition, so everything is in place for the next era of Sparks. So with that in mind, let's jump forward to the end of Bullet Train. It's the bullet train is known for its great design and they talk about the interior of the carriages here by saying how the fabric and the finish and the glass intersect and this can also be talking about little beethoven that album has rhythms and melodies that are woven together to make the fabric of the album the finish is this impeccable production and those two things intersect perfectly. But then what about the glass? Well, I'd argue that the single biggest influence on the album Little Beethoven is Philip Glass. So let's take a quick listen. <laughs> The repetitive structure and evolving patterns that you hear all over Little Beethoven comes right out of Philip Glass's playbook, and I think they're acknowledging him with the line as the fabric and the finish and the glass intersect. They then end the song with So What's Next? And in all of these videos here, I've given examples of where they're looking ahead in their music, where they're referencing the future. So this could be talking about Little Beethoven being next, but there's an even more intriguing possibility, and that is that they're looking beyond Little Beethoven. And the reason for that is because they're already working on Little Beethoven in parallel to Bulls. They're making two albums at once, paid for by the record company. The record company are paying for Little Beethoven, but they get Bulls. So they'd be recording two albums at once. That sounds improbable right? It'd be a miracle, and it would take proficiency and efficiency, yeah? And then there's this verse. So 
So they see a clear view of Mount Fuji, the rarest site, just as they're seeing a full view of little Beethoven for the first time. These words and textures might have lived in their heads or in rough demo form, but now they're seeing it realized for the first time, not hidden by clouds. And this isn't the first reference to Mount Fuji, because in my video for a meta guide to gratuitous sex and senseless violins, I talk about when I kiss you, I hear Charlie Parker playing and I make the case there that the whole song is about withholding the songs for Little Beethoven from the record label and that includes this line. I also think there's a great reason why they chose Mount Fuji to represent Little Beethoven, and that is because of the 36 views of Mount Fuji, the famous series of paintings by the Japanese artist Hokusai. There are many parallels to Sparks here, because Hokusai in his career went under 30 different pseudonyms, and this was a quite a common thing for Japanese artists, as they'd change their style, they'd choose a new name for themselves. But he had far more pseudonyms than any of the other major Japanese artists. So this frequent change of style is something that characterised Sparks up to this point. And interestingly, Sparks originally intended to put out Little Beethoven under a pseudonym. That was up until the point where people heard it and immediately recognised it as Sparks. There's something else in common too, because Hokusai had a long career, and it was a successful career, but the absolute pinnacle came at the end, with the 36 views of Mount Fuji. And this is similar to Beethoven, Coltrane, Lady Day, and all of the other legends referenced on what are all these bands so angry about from Little Beethoven. And of course, it's also true of Ron and Russell Mail themselves. So hopefully with this video, I've shown that there's a lot of technical expertise at play in Sparks' writing, much like the bullet train itself. And what better way to sum up the band than with this line? So that brings us to the end of another episode of A Meta Guide to Balls. I'll be back soon with It's a Knockoff. And again, thanks everybody for watching and please like and subscribe and I'll catch you all soon. Thanks. Bye.